welcome to the final session of um, the Racism and Law in Europe conversation series. Uh, my name is Liz Kremadal, and I'm co-hosting this with my colleague Stefan Salomon. Um, the session's uh, this series purpose has really been to um, get conversations started about different types of approaches to uh, uncovering the role of race and racism in um, law, specifically with uh, regard to Europe. Um, and really do this in a way that um, highlights the diversity, um, both of how um, one can make sense of, of um, race and racism within the law, but also um, the different roles that race and racism have played throughout um, law and lawmaking in the history of European legal thought. Um, so I will now leave it to Stefan to introduce today's speaker. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, Chris uh, Favors. Sorry if I butcher your name in Dutch, uh, Chris. Um, Chris, Chris teaches international law and legal theory in the law school at the University of KwaZulu uh, Natal in Durban, South Africa. And in addition to his teaching position at the University of KwaZulu Natal, he also has been a faculty member at the Harvard Law School since 2015 and visiting fellow at Oxford University in Monsai. Research. He focuses on third world approaches in international law, on critical race theory and international law, and on law and literature. And I suppose that what we're going to hear today from you, Chris, is a potpourri of different elements of all these different fields that you're actually doing research in. So without further ado, let me jump uh, kind of like to the first question. Um, and may may maybe perhaps as an overview of how sessions going to unfold for the audience. We first gonna, uh, Liz and myself, we're first gonna ask Chris a couple of questions to which he's going to respond and then we're going to open up the field uh, to questions from uh, the audience. So uh, the first question is international law and you mentioned in that article that lawyers have spent uh, the last 230 years thinking about whether international law is law but not about the notion of international in international law and how this notion of international was constructed. As part of your critique, you label the international as white international. Can you tell us exactly what you mean by that notion of white international? Thanks, Stefan, and thanks, Liz, and everyone else who's been involved in putting this together. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, yeah, so that's a good place to start. What do I mean by white international? And I guess it's sort of precursor to that is what do I mean by the international? So one way to, that I've tried to think about the international is, is as a fabrication. Um, and as a fabrication in two distinct senses, right? So the international is a fabrication in the sense that it's made up. It's an imaginary. No one's ever seen a state. No one's ever been to the international. It's a certain legal, political, and I would argue social, cultural imaginary that's made, it's fabricated, and, and, and I've argued uh, in various uh, different places that it's fabricated in part through literature, right? So it's an imaginary, it's something that we collectively imagine, but it's, but it's something that is made and manufactured and constructed. And it's also fabricated, so the international as a fabrication is, is a fabrication in the sense that it's, to my mind at least, it's, it's built or assembled across different fictional worlds, disciplinary worlds, social worlds um, and legal worlds. Right? So it's fabricated from different parts and across different disciplines, disciplines of international relations, international rules would be two obvious candidates, but I would argue disciplines of history as well participate in the fabrication or the collective fabrication of this thing called the international. And I'd point you to the work of Samara Esmier, who's, who's unpacked not only the fabrication of the international as an imaginary, over time, but also the alternative internationals that are out there, right? The alternative forms of internationalism, alternative fabrications that contest the international that came to dominate the international law. Uh, so the international as a fabrication is an imaginary that we live in, and it's a disciplinary practice or world that we make through international law. Now, what I've argued is that there are other internationals out there, but the international that international law fabricates, to be more specific, is one that was made possible by whiteness. 
and in turn made whiteness possible. So what I've tried to argue is that around the end of the 19th century, if you go back to the sort of disciplinary, the celebrated disciplinary history of international law by Marty Koshkanyemi, it talks about the emergence of this international sensibility, this, this unspecified sort of ineffable conscious and consciousness. And I've argued that in fact, around the same time, whiteness was emerging as a conscience and a consciousness. And the thing that made that the men of 1873 what brought them together and kept them together was their shared whiteness, their shared perception of the world through the lens of whiteness. Who was the voice around the same time said was the personal discovery of whiteness. That's a very modern thing. So the idea that to be white was to be wonderful was something that was that made international as a discipline possible, that made all these white men thinking that they were pursuing different projects find something in common um, in 1873 and, and around them. So in some both in a sense that whiteness brought these individuals together to found the discipline of international law, but also in fact that whiteness itself was constructed through the discipline through what Charles Moore calls the racial contract. Right? So the international law as a discipline, as the juridical conscience of mankind, was effectively a, a, a system of establishing white supremacy that made the participants see themselves as white. So Charles Moore argues that the racial contract, which is an agreement amongst people to, to treat certain phenotypically uh, specific people as white and everyone else is somehow less than human is something that is constructed through law and politics and that you become white by law, right? So in a sense, you became white and international as an international lawyer at the same time and through the same process, right? Those were co-constituted. It's not a coincidence that the rise of whiteness and particularly biological racism coincided with the reinvention of a discipline of international law what I've tried to argue, uh, reading, surpassing not only um, legal texts and this history, Chris? but also international. Yes. So essentially the argument is that, that the international, so the, the particular international that emerged, understanding international as a fabrication, the particular international that emerged in the late 19th century and continues to predominate the discipline was one that was made possible by global white supremacy and in turn solidified and globalized global white supremacy through the racial contract through the idea that it was possible for a bunch of white men in Ghent to declare themselves the uh, juridical conscience of mankind. Only whiteness makes that kind of um, delusion possible. But at the same time, that delusion is made possible through the types of racial contracts and structures that were established by the men of 1873 and then consecrated through international law. Right, so I've tried to take what it seems to be a coincidence of the emergence of a particular virulent biological racism that Du Bois said was the personal discovery of whiteness that happens around the end of the 19th century and the emergence of the discipline and said that these two things are not coincidental, they're co-constitutive. Uh, to be white was to be international and to be international was to be white. Okay, great. So um, you've now already touched a little bit on this, but I would like to um, dig a little deeper in the relation of international law as a discipline to the question of race and racism. So you also write um, that international law's most violent act may uh, be its disavowal of race um, and um, its ability to not to speak about race or to speak about it gently. Um, could you elaborate a little bit by, on what you mean by that? Sure. So, so let me also, I guess, as an addendum to what I've finished on. So the idea that the international that was constructed in the 19th century was all about race, or was made possible through race, was very clearly stated at the time. We never cite the parts of Westlake that say this, but Westlake said, um, shortly after the founding of the Institute de Dwar, that international law is the, and I'll quote, is the rules which are internationally recognized between white men and that govern the international society of the white race, right? And what he meant by that was European states, and states of European blood, and we'll come back to that. So if you look at the history of a discipline, if you take it on its own terms, and Westlake, who was supposedly the father of international law in many respects, was very clear about the fact that this was about the international society of the white race and of people of European blood, right? By which he meant um, settler colonies or what Gerald Horne calls um, European, Europeans, oh, sorry, Europe's revolting spawn. So the revolting spawn of Europe, i.e. the United States and various settler colonies, Australia, were part of um, this European international society of the white race. But the ability of us to, under so it's, in some senses it's clearly articulated, but part of what makes race difficult to trace is what 
one of my favorite Cedric Robinson quotes is that race is mercurial, deadly and slick. But right? so race tends to shift from registers. It reconstitutes itself in other racial regimes are then unpacked and proved to be wrong. And then they reemerge in different guises. Right? So tracing race is very difficult in part because race and racial racialization and racial domination by its very nature claims to be beyond history but to be immutable and beyond history and beyond science. So tracing race is very difficult. And part of what makes this difficult is that disciplines disavow race. And I can point to the work of Charles Moores on philosophy or Toni Morrison on literature, Errol Henderson on IR, but there's a tendency within disciplines, across disciplines to disavow race. And, and in particular, the work that's inspired me on this is Toni Morrison who, su who suggests that the way we don't talk about race is twofold, through silence and through evasion. But so either we simply don't speak about it, we render it unspeakable within our disciplines. Um, and I can point you to the work of James Gatti, who's recently gone through all the last hundred years of the American Journal of International Law and in less than a little over 1% of those articles speak about race. Right? So just outright silence is one way to not talk about race. But in some senses, the more difficult thing to track and to pin down is the way that race is evaded as a topic. And I've tried to point out that race is evaded, at least to my mind, in international law in three very specific ways, and they're interrelated. So race is evaded by international law first through what I've called depoliticization, right? So when you horizontalize race as an individual prejudice and you disconnect it from structures of power and hierarchy, right? So race then becomes something, that, a bad idea in people's heads, a problem that Lorimer had as opposed to the very structure of the international system established by the men of 1873, right? So when we disconnect race from structures of domination, we depoliticize it, such that it becomes something that we can address through diversity training or awareness, as opposed to something that's woven into the structures of society, politics, and law. And this is a very clear, so Charles Moore's writes about white supremacy as a socio-political system with social, economic, political, moral, epistemological dimensions, right? So depoliticizing race, thinking of race as an individual aberration and an individual view as opposed to a structure is the first way that international law disavows and evades conversations about race. Right? Second and related to this, the way international law disavows or evades race, this is what I've called dehistoricization. Right? So to take, and it's connected because once you think of race as racism, as individual prejudice, then and logically, anyone can be racist. Anyone can have a bad idea. So when you disconnect race from structure, race becomes a universal problem. And this is actually a project, if you read the book by Frank Ferruti called The Silent War, this is a project of Western powers right the way through the 19th century, is to eternalize race. So race becomes not a problem of Europe or whiteness or colonialism or slavery, but a universal problem of just bigotry, right? So you dehistoricize race when you disconnect race not only from the specifically Western origins of European racism and white supremacy, but from the systems of colonialism and slavery, right? You can do that because you've already depoliticized it. So when you disconnect race from the West, when you no longer consider race a Western thing, you dehistoricize it, you take it outside of its context and it becomes a universal problem for international law to solve, as opposed to a problem that, very, that structures international law as a discipline. And the third way that we evade and avoid talking about race and international law and related to the first two is through domestica domestication. So we domesticate race when we think of race as a problem that happens in discrete national contexts. Right? We place race within the context of apartheid South Africa or in the context of Zionism or in the context of particular Eastern European states who have problem, as opposed to thinking of race as always already a global idea. Race by its very nature pretends to be a global phenomenon. White supremacy by its very nature is a global, has historically been a global structure and continues to work through the international and globally um, across borders. But when we start to think about race as a domestic problem for specific states, then we intervene um, in some senses at the minor level as opposed to thinking of race as a transnational structure. So the way that race works is not just between individuals and society or even between states, but transnationally. Uh, we have to learn to think about the way that racial projects and racialization in America are connected to other pro projects of white supremacy across the world and not to domesticate each problem as a specifically state-based problem. Right? We have to think about race across borders um, and racialization as always already, as I say, a transnational and global project. 
And so if we can do that, if we can, if we can re-politicize race, think of race as structure, if we can re-historicize race, think of race, and, and I use the term global white supremacy, not racism, but global white supremacy, I'm following the work of Charles Moore, because this is the term that really captures what we're talking about. So we think of global white supremacy as a, as a Western project um, and not a universal problem. And then we think of race as not just domestic, but international, i.e. between states, and transnational. Um, then I think we can start to have conversations in a more fruitful way about race. But as long as we continue to either not speak about it or depoliticize, dehistoricize, and domesticate it, we will, we will still struggle to get at the, at the core um, of the problem of white supremacy and its relationship to its constitutive relationship in respect of international law. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we we'll have so many follow up questions, but maybe we should uh, kind of like deal with them later, kind of like in the open up the conversation. So, uh, one point this is kind of like linked to what I've mentioned at the uh, to what I've asked you at the outset of this uh, conversation is what I find particularly intriguing about the scholarship is that you do not only show racialization through classical, so to say, kind of like legal scholarship, but that you also weave fiction and, 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 and literature analysis into your articles. Um, so, which basically brings me to my next question. How does fiction help in your scholarship to unmask process of racialization in international law, or international legal practice, and scholarship? And why do you think literature is such a powerful tool for this specific purpose? Well, thanks. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. Um, let me try to answer it fairly specifically. So, so the way that I've, and across two axes, so the way that I've thought about literature is both as an archive of white internationalism. So an archive of thinking about the white international and its construction, right? And we might call internationalist fiction, I would say white internationalist fiction as an archive um, that inscribes particular projects of white supremacy. And then also I've thought along the same lines um, at, with black internationalist fiction, which is, is not only as a counter archive of other forms of internationalism, but as an archive that was always already a critique of the white international, right? So, so in my understanding of how literature can be beneficial, it's if you take those two archives, both the archives of white literature, or European literature as an archive of white supremacy, but also of resistance literature, of, of African-American or third world literature as an archive of resistance that both speaks to alternatives, but also speaks to um, or, or disentangles or maps the sort of unspeak and unspokens of white internationalism. So in that sense, I think that literature can be two things. It can be both a historical way to trace processes of racialization. So I've tried to use the work of Haggard and John Buchan um, and, and Robert Louis Stevenson to show how the construction of the white international was taken place in fiction. So at the very same time that people are constructing um, or that men of 1873 are imagining their international conscience that gives them license to be the juridical man, uh, the juridical conscience of mankind. Robert Louis Stevenson's writing a novel about a couple of fellows who imagine themselves as being able to colonize the world because their project is international, right? So the very emergence of the international as a term at the same time in the novels of Robert Louis Stevenson and in the work of the men of 1873 is interesting to me. And then if you look at that unfolding, if you look at the novels of Haggard and Buchan, you can see this project. Um, and in particular, the work of, of Buchan, the novel by Buchan um, that I've used quite extensively that I've now just forgotten, uh, not Island of Sheep, uh, Lodge in the Wilderness, right? So Lodge in the Wilderness is a novel written by Buchan, this massive racial fantasy that seems completely impossible, published in 1906, and basically becomes the League of Nations, right? So the League of Nations is anticipated long before Smuts even dreamed it up in a novel by John Buchan. John Buchan would have a role in the formation of the League of Nations in an in indirect way, but that in some sense of these white fictions inscribe particular contexts and projects. And it's historically, you can use um, white international fiction to trace those projects, right? From Buchan all the way through to Evelyn Moore, right the way through to the present. Um, at the same time, Black internationalist fiction emerges as a critique of the white international. So the work of Pauline Hopkins or W.B. Du Bois or George Shaw or Peter Abrahams, Sabrina Kwesi, various other writers are literate and can see the international, the white international for what it is and develop both complex mappings of the white international 
and complex map mappings of racialization. So for example, to me, the best philosophical book that describes the process of how white supremacy op operates is Charles Mills' The Racial Contract. So the racial contract as a way of understanding the operations of race philosophically is mirrored 90 years before it was written in the text by W. Du Bois called The Dark Princess, where he imagines this fantasy of a struggle against white world supremacy that maps the way that white world supremacy operates in its political and social and economic and, and other dimensions, right? So they are in these novels, these are archives of counter histories, but also archives of counter imaginaries that point out precisely how racialization works within international law. Give you one more example, a novel by George Shiler, which is this fantasy about the decolonization of Africa written in 1935 in 1936. So part of the project of decolonizing Africa for George Shala is the problem of transnational whiteness. So the problem of decolonizing Africa for George Shala in the 1930s is that if you intervene in Africa, America will then intervene to, to what he says, preserve the prestige of the white race, right? So to prevent that in the novel, he ferments a, a, a civil war in America using white nationalists as allies to create a civil war in America that prevents the Prevent, prevents America from intervening to save white South Africans and white uh, other settler communists from this decolonization. So in his novel, he's recognized the power of transnational white identity as an impediment to decolonization and then addresses it in really interesting and fantastic ways that have a lot of resonance with the presence. Right? So that in these novels, they are not just complex alternative internationalisms, which I think they are, but they're complex ways of coming to terms with consciously inscribing the project of white supremacy in ways that these authors, particularly black international fiction authors, really um, were aware of because of their political understandings, but were able to, to express them in fiction in ways that perhaps they couldn't express them. So a lot of the George, so George Shiloh and Du Bois wrote nonfiction, obviously, but their fiction to me captures, uh, and it's what Steve Biko called, the totality of whiteness. It's, a, it's such a world-making project that is so present and so surreptitious and so hard to trace that these novels get, get a grip on all of that. And I think certainly The Dark Princess is one that does that very well. Um, yeah, so I think, I think fiction is a way one way I've tried to think about it more concretely is to think of both fiction and international law as world-making practices. And then to think, okay, what kind of worlds are made by international law and what kind of ways do fictions both make that world with international law? So way, how do they fabricate it together? But in what ways does black internationalist fiction unmake that world? So in what ways do the novels of Pauline Hopkins and, and Du Bois unmake the geography of the international, unmake the history of the international? show the international to be, as Charlotte put it in 1936, a white international. Right? Those are not my terms, they are taken from a novel. George Charlotte says in 1936, the black international emerges as a response to the white international. And what does he mean? He means international law. Great, sorry, it took me a moment to unmute myself. Um, First of all, I think we'll have many questions regarding Westlake as the father of international law and this <laughs> audience in the Netherlands. Um, so that should be fun. <laughs> but this actually does bring us to um, the last question that we have. Um, um, that is, how, um, how do you locate European um, history and your, uh, well, let me phrase it differently. Um, when you when you speak about European international law and the European imaginary international law, um, how does race come into play, and um, how do you locate it? Yeah, so I mean, I see. I mean, when you the question is sort of bracketed around the question of what is European, right? And that, and that, I think there's an importance at the beginning of that to think about what do we mean when we say European. I mean, European is, and, and if you go to the very first edition of the, of the European Journal of International Law, you'll see that that journal was established, I think, in 1990, in the pursuit of defending this, what they call an incoherent, an incoherent, and I would call an incoherent notion of European identity. What does it mean to be European? To, to Du Bois in 1917, it was very clear, but by Europe you meant what? Right? To Westlake, writing in the late 19th century, European meant European and of European blood. So. I was hesitatingly calling Westlake, perhaps not the father of international, but the father of modern international. If you read Westlake's 
definitions of international, there's always a shifting, shifting between whiteness and Europeanness, shifting between Europeanness as a geographical expression, as a biological expression, right? So he refers to nations of Europe and those of European blood, of European ancestry, so white nations, right? So the ability of international to shift between understandings of identity that are called European, that are called white, um, that are signified by blood, that are signified by memory or signified by history, that are signified um, by geography, is part of how international works. And what I've, I've tried to do in bits and pieces, but I've been doing on the side, is to try to trace all the various slippages in the way that Westlake tries to define international law using Europe. How Europe is never quite sufficient. There's always a slippage, Europe plus European blood, right? Europe at some point in Westlake's definitions becomes a geographical expression that somehow has geographically includes the US. By, by Europe, he's not meaning continental Europe, he's meaning whiteness, but he can't quite say whiteness because of even then the disavowal of race, or he doesn't want to always say whiteness. So I think part of the conversation about how to think about Europe and race is to think about what's the relation between Europe and whiteness, right? And, and I think in some senses, the ability that when we talk about as the Euro European Journal of International Law declares itself in 1990 about being about European identity and being about a certain European tradition, I see whiteness. I see this about defending a particular idea of whiteness and a particular idea of by European tradition. I'm not sure if there is a tradition of Europe that isn't already entangled in whiteness. It's certainly not a geographical expression. Uh, definitions of Europe and international certainly always have some attachment to settler colonialism. So I'm not sure what European is without some, some slippage into racial categories and some slippage into that marker of race called blood. Um, so the way that I've, so I don't have a specific, that's a way to answer your question. I don't have a specific approach. I think of Europe, I think of whiteness, and then I think of international on those terms. And I'm not sure disaggregating Europe from whiteness from international law would be, I don't think it would be useful. I don't think it'd be analytically very easy because it'd be difficult to know precisely when the shifts was referring to something called a geographically bounded Europe and something called something called of European blood or Europeanness. The way that I've tried to do it in terms of whiteness, well, I've, I've principally tried to show using both the novels of people like Stevenson Havard um, Buchan and Evan, Evan Moore and others, and also the novels of Du Bois and Hopkins and Charla and others, to try to show, and as I say, to try and map um, the unfolding of a particular European identity or whiteness and a particular European history or mytholo uh, European mythology called history or paraded as history, um, and also its geography. So I've tried to think of novels as sort of repositories, as what Charles Mills would call these counter geographies, counter histories, counter imaginaries, all sort of buried and mapped in these novels that we can pull them out of that and to try to think of how this unfolds over time. What would a, what would a, and I don't want to use the term non-European, but what would a, what would a subversively not European, I don't know, non-European is a problematic term for our company. So what would a, what would a, what would a geography of the international mean that wasn't written from Europe? What would a history of the international mean that wasn't written from Europe? What would a sociology, what, who would be the, the persons of international law, if you wouldn't write it from a European center, the place that I've found most of those answers has been in fiction. Um, and I've tried to use fiction to map both the construction of that and its disavowal, um, and, and, and to look at black internationalist fiction. And, and I should say black, black internationalism more generally as a tradition, uh, what, what Cedric Robinson called the black radical tradition. So not only fictional works, but non-fictional writing of people like Du Bois and C.R.R. James and Padmore. And if you read Adam Getachew's book, a lot of Adam's work is focusing on kind of the non-fictional aspects of that. And I'm, I've looked at it with a bit more of an eye to the fiction. Mm -hmm.